Look, make sure it was still morning. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Sometimes I get up here and I, I say good morning and everybody just looks at me like, where have you been? <laughs> it's good to see everybody and I, I want to thank you for inviting me back down. It's been a couple of years since we've been here. In fact, this November will be two years and good to see some of you again and good to see new faces and always appreciate the time I get to share the, the word of God with people. Uh, that's always been my main goal is to just help others to find peace and contentment in the Lord and and to be able to take that walk that he wants us to walk. And, you know, with all the, everything that's going on today, uh, a few years back I might have considered not coming down here, you know, with the hurricane coming on shore. But, you know, after a while when we learn to truly trust in God, it brings peace to us. We don't have to worry. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fear. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Because with everything happening in the world today, we're seeing disasters everywhere. We're seeing floods like we've never seen before. You know, I, I've heard so many times, even in our area in Kansas City, we've had historical floods that have completely wiped out businesses that uh, before would flood, you know, just a little bit and they'd get back up and go again. But now they're not opening again. I was listening to the news the other day and they were talking about this hurricane possibly affecting the refineries here in, in Texas. Well, what do you think that's going to do to the gas prices? <laughs> and, and so everything that happens, you know, causes us sometimes to worry and to, to fret about, you know, what's going to happen with my family? What's going to happen with me? Are we going to be able to survive? Well, today I hope to share with you some things that will help if you don't already have the peace and the, the contentment in the Lord. I hope that I'll be able to help you to find that. Because that's our job as ministers is to help others to, to learn and, and to be able to walk with the Lord in the way that he desires us to walk. You know, so many times the problems that we have are not just that we don't listen to him, it's that we worry so much about ourselves and what we want to do that we shut him out. And then he can't work in our lives. And so, like I say, I want to share with you today, uh, if you'll turn with me to the Psalms, we'll start there this morning. I, I got a little tickled when they named the, the Hurricane Harvey because I, I thought about a movie with James Stewart you know, called Harvey and a Rabbit, and, and that rabbit didn't do anybody any harm, so I, I thought, this just doesn't fit. But, you know, we're having earthquakes in places that we haven't had them before. We're seeing volcanoes come to life in places that they've never come to life. The ring of fire they're, they're talking now is actually coming to life. They're still predicting a major earthquake in Missouri in the New Madrid Fault. And they say when it happens, we will probably feel it all the way in Kansas City. They're also looking at Yellowstone National Park. And they say each year it raises so many you know, centimeters and meters. And, and uh, they're worried about a major explosion because they said underneath uh, Yellowstone National Park is a major volcano. And so, you know, these kind of things people see in the news and they think about them and, and they start thinking, well, how's that going to affect me? How's that going to affect my family? The crime rate itself has gone up considerably. In Kansas City, we've had more murders this year than we've ever had in, in you know, counting up several years. People are robbing, they're, they're losing jobs, and then they go out and they take whatever they want from everybody else. And so we have to consider this. And so... We don't want to live in fear, though. You know, many times, used to be when we'd leave for the feast, we, we secured everything. I put boards over the windows, you know, to make sure nobody would break in when uh, we left for, you know, the Feast of Tabernacles or any of the holy days. But, you know, then I began to read scriptures where God said, I'll take care of you when you go to my feast. I'll protect your property. And that brought me peace. And so now we go off, we lock the doors, we don't have any security in our homes. You see all these advertisements today for life lock protection on your cards and, and you have uh, ADT, home security, all these things. And, and all that does is instill fear in people and they think that that is their security. But I'll tell you now, you and I, as God's children, have the best security money can't buy. We have the best security that money can't buy by trusting in God because he says he'll take care of us, he'll protect us, he'll watch over us. 
If you look at uh, Psalms chapter 3, or excuse me, chapter 4 and, and verse 8, there's just one verse in here that David wrote that brings me comfort too when I think about it. And wouldn't we all like to have this? I was telling someone here earlier that I said I don't always sleep good, but that's mostly because of the aches and pains of the things I did wrong when I was a young teenager thinking I was invincible. So I feel it today. But we can still have peaceful sleep. And when I talk about peaceful sleep, it's not a, a lot of people in the church I know I have, have tormenting dreams sometimes, and they say, why do I have these? You're not at peace yet. You have, there's something wrong in your life, and you have to find out what that problem is, and you have to correct it and get in line with God's will. And he says right here in verse 8, I, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. When we know we're safe, we don't have torment. As the Bible says, fear is torment, and fear comes from Satan. He wants us to run around fearful all the time. He wants us to be afraid. He wants us to just run about like a chicken with our head cut off. You know, no direction, like sheep without a shepherd, going in every which way. But it's not to be that way. Let's go to Psalm 29, verse 11. And like I say, these are just little verses I wanted to start off with today because they're so important to us. And, and if you haven't underlined them, underline them and mark them and go back to them. Repeat them until they become permanent in your mind. If you look at Psalm 29, verse 11, it says, The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. You see, he wants us to have peace. You say, well, how can we have peace in, in these times of tribulation, trials, turmoil that's going on around us? If we put our trust in God, he will bring peace into our lives. When I go away from home, I don't worry about it. In fact, in my mind, I picture two angels standing on my driveway with swords to keep anything that would do harm to our property or, or to any of us to keep us from harm. And some would say, well, that's crazy. No, that's faith. I trust God. I believe in him. And that's where we all need to be. When my family, I used to, I tell a story about my wife. Well, I probably not tell it because I get very emotional when I do. But I almost lost her when we first got married. And I couldn't understand why God would take her out of my life. Well, the reason was because I put her before him. I worshipped the ground she walked on. I loved her that much. I wanted to be with her. I wanted to protect her. Well, I found out I couldn't protect her. She was in a head-on car wreck, and when they called me, they said, I don't know if your wife's dead or alive. And so I, it got me to thinking. I thought, you know, how can I protect my family? When my kids would go out, I'd worry about them. Well, today, when they leave, they'll call me and say, did you miss me? And I'll say, were you gone? <laughs> no, I, I do know they're gone. But it, it's so peaceful. I don't have to worry about them because I can't protect them. Even when they're with me, I can't protect them from harm. And that's what we have to understand. We have to let the control that we want to have over everything, we've got to let it go. We have to give it to God. If we give it to him, he'll take care of it. It's his in the first place. Everything that we have, our possessions, our family, they're all just possessions that he has gifted us with and blessed us with to have in this walk of life. But they don't belong to us. They belong to him. And once we take that attitude, when we start thinking that way, it brings you great peace and joy. And isn't that what we want? To be able to walk around, not be fearful when we walk out uh, down a dark alley, not to be afraid, to know that God is with us. Didn't Jesus say, I'll be with you always? Well, that doesn't mean that he picks and chooses what time he's going to be with you. He says, I'm with you always. Through his Holy Spirit, he protects us as we walk. God says he walks in us and with us always. Not just at 8 o'clock in the morning, not just at 6 p.m. at night, but always, every day, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. He's always with us. Let's go to uh, and look at a prophecy of Zacharias, uh, John the Baptist's uh, father, in Luke 1. In 
in verse 78, Luke 1 and verse 78. And he says, Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. He's talking about our Lord. He came so that he could guide us in to the way of peace. Well, how do we get into that way of peace? I've told you a few things that we can do in changing the way we think, letting go of things, you know, not holding so fast to the possessions we have, and that way we don't have to worry about if they get taken from us, or if we lose them, it's not a big deal. We can go on and have peace in our lives. Let's look at what Jesus actually said in John 14. I like to say, mark, mark these verses because they're, they're so good to go back to. John chapter 14. And these are the words of our Lord and Savior. John 14, verse 27. He says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. Because see, there's no peace in the world. The world is, is in turmoil right now. We can't find peace in the world. We can't find peace in trusting what the world says is right. What the world says is wrong. We trust in what the Lord says is right and what he says is wrong. He says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. See, he's taking fear out of it if we just trust him. If we believe in him. Do you have the faith that it needs to believe in God and put your whole life, everything that you have, in his hands? And trust him to watch over it for you. Let's go to John 16, another verse. John 16, verse 33. And like I say, I'm just hitting on a few today, but, but they're very important verses for us. Verse 33 in John 17. He says, These things that I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You see, Christ came in the flesh so that he could overcome everything that you and I might have to face. And see, by him succeeding and overcoming, he can take the fear and bring us peace in tribulation and trials because he faced everything that you and I will ever face. Isn't that great? I mean, that's the way to peace, is to trust in God. And you're going to hear me say that many times, because I want to in, ingrain that into you today, if you haven't done it already. So what do we need to do in order to have this peace? Well, I've told you a few things, but let's go and see what Peter had to say in 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. I was told one time in the past that I used too many verses, but what better way to get it across than use the Word of God? 2 Peter 1 and verse 1 says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained the, like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. You see, he gives us a key right there. We can have grace and peace through the knowledge of what? The knowledge of God, the knowledge of our Lord. If we understand him and the way that he lived, if we learn about him, then we can understand how to have peace and contentment. And I'm going to get into some uh, scriptures about contentment here in a little bit. Because they're very important. If we can't be content, we can't have peace. And so he says, in verse 3, According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Again, it's talking about the knowledge of God. He's given us everything that we need. The problem is we don't always go and seek it out. We just depend on our own thoughts. We get trusting in the world and, and the things that uh, we're told. That won't get us anywhere. We can't gain anything if we don't trust in the Word of God. And I always tell people, you can go anywhere out there and find all kinds of knowledge and everything, but the best knowledge you can find is right here in this book. That's how I learned about the Church of God. That's how I learned about the Sabbath day. That's how I learned about God's feast days. 
That's how I learned those things. He showed me in his word. Go on in verse 4, it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And that lust, the, the world lusts after their own things. You, you'll see stickers on trucks that say, you know, he who dies with the most toys wins. Uh, I, I always hated that sticker. It always bothered me for some reason. Now I know why. But it's not about how much we can gain through the world, it's about how much we can gain towards eternal life and salvation. That's where our goal needs to be. That's where we need to be seeking. That's where our knowledge needs to be. Asking God every day, I ask him every day when I get up, give me more of your wisdom and knowledge because that's the only way I can get through my life. That's the only way I can get through the day sometimes is through his wisdom and knowledge. And so he says, partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in us through the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. He's talking about us learning. It's a learning process when we begin to walk with God. We start as babes and hopefully we can continue to gain in faith and in strength and in our walk. So that each day we draw closer to God and getting in line with what he wants from us. Not what we want. It's... What we want is not important, except that we seek God. That is the most important thing in our life, is that we seek God and His will. That should be our ultimate goal. If you're going to write something down and say, this is my goal, you know, we set goals for exercise, we set goals for health and all that. Make your primary goal seeking God and His wisdom and knowledge, and all this other things will come into place. They'll fall into their own place and in their own time. It says... In verse 6, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. See, this is something, brotherly kindness is something that we need, all to need to work on. Because we can be awful mean and cruel at times. And brotherly kindness, when you think about it, that even extends into your family. You know, sometimes we can be mean to our own spouses. You know, and it's, this isn't what God wants. We have to learn to love everyone. Didn't he tell us, love your enemies? Well, if, we, if he tells us to love our enemies, I know he wants us to love everyone else in our lives. And he tells us to love one another so that people can see Christ working in us, so they, they can see that we are children of God. I mean, that is the greatest witness. I, I heard someone say one time that uh, the only Bible that some people may see is the way you walk in your life. That may be the only example that they ever see. They may not ever open the book at, at that time, but to see your example, the, the way that you live in your life is so important. That's the greatest witness that we can have because we never know who's watching us, who's looking at us, who's learning from our example. You know, sometimes you're planting seeds and you don't even know it, but God will reap the harvest and he will reward you for it. Let's go on in... Uh, he says in verse 7, And to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says they have to abound. It's not something that's just casual. They need to abound in you. They, they need to be important. They need to be very important in our lives. He says, but he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence. You know, diligence means really strive for it. Go after it. It is so important for us to know the Lord and to know his ways if we're going to make it through the trials and tribulations that we may face in the coming years. He says, make your calling and an election sure. For if you do these things, now listen to what he says and underline this. He says, you shall never fall if you make your calling and election sure. Well, what he's telling us, we have to work on ourselves because we are by no means perfect. We all have failures. We all have faults. We all stumble and fall at times. But the idea is to get back up and fix that that we did wrong. Repent of it and go on. And don't do it again. 
I mean, that's the learning process. When you make a mistake, you try not to make the, that same mistake again, right? It's so important for us to keep learning and keep growing. Turn to James 3. James 3 and verse 13. He says, Who is a wise man and endued, endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a co good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But he also says, If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. You know, so many times we have problems, but we don't want to admit them. We lie about them. We lie to ourselves. We lie to everyone else about it. Oh, we don't have a problem. You can't lie to God. You don't even have to say it. You can't lie to God. You can't think a lie to God. He knows everything that's in your heart. And so we have to put away any bitterness, any envy. I mean, these are things that will cause us torment, and we cannot have peace with those things in our lives. And so we have to learn to forgive. He says, This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. This is the flesh. These are fleshly things coming from Satan. They don't come from God above. He says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. We can't do a good work until we get all the bitterness, the envying, anything that we might have that's keeping us and preventing us from being close to God and walking in his will. We have to get those out of our lives. And then we can walk in the righteous path that he wants us to walk in. And he will bless us and help us to find peace. He says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. See, we have to learn how to make peace in all situations. That's one of the challenges that he gives us if we want to have a, a perfect walk with the Lord. We have to learn to make peace in everything, whether it be in, uh, you know, when we're being tormented, when we're being tried, when we're going through great tribulation, Whatever it may be, we have to learn to make peace. When we're dealing with other people, we have to learn to make peace. And sometimes that's very hard. When you've got somebody that's picking on you or, or angering you, or calling you names, it's hard to make peace. But this is what God tells us to do. We can do it. We just have to make our minds. It, the reason we don't do it is because we choose not to. We choose to say, sometimes we, we want to choose to stay in our, our you know, doldrums, our, our bitterness, our, our failures, and we want to just sit there and, and say, oh, woe is me. Want everybody to look at us and say, have mercy on me. You know? But this isn't what God tells us to do. He says, get up, walk, go, go forward. If we're sitting around, we're not getting any work done, are we? You know, if you sit in your chair all day, you won't get the fields plowed, you won't get the grass mowed, you won't get anything accomplished. And so we have to be active. We have to keep doing the work of God if we're going to find peace. Lost my note here. And then let's go to 1 Peter 3. Okay. Actually, I gave you the wrong verse. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Sorry. One of my markers fell out. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. 
You see, our biggest battle right now is with our flesh, with our own minds. That's what causes us so much torment, that causes us so much unrest, because we're battling with ourselves. We can blame all that we want to on Satan. We can say, oh, the devil made me do it. But that's not true. We allowed him to do it. Because doesn't Christ say that if we rebuke him, he has to flee? Then why don't we rebuke him? Why don't we tell him to get away? Sometimes we let him just beat us down to, to almost nothing before we finally say, oh, enough's enough. And sometimes I've seen people that don't ever get to that point. No matter how much you encourage them, they still don't feel that they can honor God. They f just don't feel that they can continue the walk. Turn to Romans 8, verse 5. And let's think about what Paul's saying here. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. You see, he's putting a separation there. If we go after the flesh, we can't serve God in the way that he wants us to, to serve him. We can't please him if we're serving the flesh. And serving the flesh is, again, as I talked earlier, like putting things before God. You know, sometimes we can become our own idol because we get, begin to worship the things that we desire more than the things that God wants of us. And so we battle with the flesh constantly. Our minds are constantly being bombarded. I mean, you, you turn on a TV today and you get bombarded with, oh, you need to take this drug and that drug and, and you need to do this, but the side effects will kill you. Uh, you know, it, it's, we're bombarded constantly with things like this. When you go down the road, you see advertisements and things. And, and, and these are the things of the world that God is trying to warn us, stay away from because they won't help you. He is our Savior. He is our salvation. He is our healer. He is our health. He is our peace. I mean, you can put every good name upon Jesus the Christ. And this is what God wants of us. He says, for to be carnally minded is death. If we hold on to the flesh, if we follow after fleshly desires and things, it leads us away from God. And it can take us all the way out of the kingdom of God. He says, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. When we start reading the word of God, when we start studying, when we start taking it and applying it to our lives, it brings health to us, it brings strength. I did a sermon a while back on the sustaining spirit. God's spirit can sustain us. I've seen him sustain people that doctors said should already be dead. They don't know, but God knows. And he's not through with us until he's through. But if we take ourselves out of his will, things might happen a little bit quicker and a little bit earlier for us. So we need to walk. We need to take the things of the flesh and put them aside and start looking up to God. Again, he is our salvation. He is the one we need to be looking at. Stop, stop looking down and, and dragging our knuckles on the ground, you know. Get excited again. Get that fire and go out and help others to find peace and hope. That is our job. He says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Your mind is constantly, your thoughts are constantly trying to resist God. Your mind, the things that we think, aren't the things that God thinks a lot of times. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Our ways are not always his ways. And so it's a change of attitude. It's a change of mind. It's a change of heart. Like I said, I, I've repeated this a lot today, but I want to try and embed. If you don't understand where to find peace, this is what I'm sharing with you today, is how we can find true peace in this world that we live in, no matter what happens. You know, I think about the, the punishment that, that Christ went through. If you remember in the garden, now, he... He wept, and he asked God, he said, take this cup from me. He was scared. I mean, he was flesh, just like us. So many people say that he came as a God being and that he didn't understand fear. Oh, what a lie. What a deceitful lie. He understood fear. He had to go through everything that you and I would ever face in order to be the high priest that he is today. He did it for us, but we have to trust him and believe it. He said, 
for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Our mind, again, we resist the laws, we resist, we sin against God because we don't think according to his will. We don't think the way that he thinks. And we can learn by his word. He says, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. I mean, how much clearer can you be? If you're living in the flesh, if you're following after your fleshly desires, you're not pleasing God. I didn't say it. It says it right here. Do you want to please God? Do you want to make him happy? Do you want to have the peace? Do you want to have the blessings? There's so many blessings with following God and trusting him. You know, many of us haven't seen all the blessings that he has in store for us. But we will as we get further and further in line with his will and do things his way. He says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. If you have the spirit of God, we should be changing our lives. We should be heeding the spirit's guidance. That's what God gave us his spirit for, as a comforter, as a guide for us, to lead us and help us to learn God's ways, to lead us along the paths that he wants us to walk. But we have to be willing to listen. You know, I think about the, the verse that David talked about. He said, you know, just be still and know that I'm God. You know, sometimes in this hectic world that we live in, there's so much noise, so much static, so many things going on that we don't have any quiet time with God. So we have to make that quiet time. We have to get away. We have to hide out somewhere, run from your children, whatever you have to do, you know. Uh, get out and, and seek God. Seek his will. Whenever David or anyone had a question, what did they do? They prepared themselves. They fasted and they seeked God. We can do the same thing. In fact, the Lord tells us we need to, to seek God. We need to fast. He says, now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If they don't have the spirit of God, then they're not his yet. But that can be remedied. That can be fixed. That can be solved. You know, one battle, as I talked about, in trying to have peace is learning how to be content. You know, contentment has great gain to it. In fact, let's turn to 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6. What's the first thing he says here? But godliness with contentment is great gain. You can be godly in your actions, but if you don't have contentment, you're not gaining anything. But if you're content in God, if you're content in your life, then it's great gain for you. As I said, there's many blessings that God... Uh, many of us haven't even learned about yet, or we know about, but we haven't received because we're not doing what God asks us to do. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world. Again, remember I told you earlier that nothing belongs to us. We brought nothing. When you were born, you didn't bring a thing into this world. You were naked. You had to be provided for. And as we grew... And began our walk with God. We learned. We received things. We had possessions. God blessed us with things. And it's not that he didn't want us to have things. Don't get me wrong. But we shouldn't worship those things. We need to take all our possessions and look at them and say, do I really need this? You know, I think about the early church and how, you know, they, they got together and they sold the extra things that they had. And so that everybody in the church could have, you know, be equal. Have the same. You know, we need to clean house. All of us need to clean house, even myself. Not only our bodies, the temple in which God's spirit dwells, but our physical homes. We are pack rats. I know I am. I, I was in the construction business for 26 years, and I got trailers and houses full of all the things that I didn't use, thinking I'd need them again one day. Well... We're cleaning the house. We're going to get rid of those things. But it, it's the choices we make. They, they have to become less important to us than what God is in our lives. He has to be first and foremost. It says, and having, or it says, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. You can't take anything with you when you die. You know, somebody else will get it. And most time it's the kids come in and they take everything. But, uh, 
he says, we can't take anything with us. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Just having food and clothing, he says, be content with that. If you lost everything today, would you be able to be content with just the clothes on your back and be able to have food to, to eat? I mean, it's something we really need to think about. Times are going to get worse. And I, I, sometimes people say, well, you sound like Jeremiah. The, 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 he's always preaching whoa, whoa, whoa. Always preaching problems. But, you know, we have to look at reality. The only one that's going to bring peace to this world is Jesus Christ. I, I, you know, I pray for the president and all the government, but they're never going to bring peace. Maybe a, a short time, maybe a little time, but they, it won't be a lasting peace no matter what they do. He says, for the love of, of money is the root of all, or excuse me, let me go back to nine. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. A lot of people say, well, we can't have any money. We have to be poor. That's not what it's saying here. It's just saying when you start loving the money and loving the possessions more than God, you're going to bring hurt to yourself. You're going to bring curse upon yourself rather than blessing. He says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. When you start thinking money is going to fix all the problems, you've started down a path to destruction. You've started down a path to problems. He says, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. Run away from them. Get up and go. He says, flee these things and follow after righteousness. Godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Live the life of a child of God. Live the way that he wants us to. Let's turn to Philippians real quick. I'm going to try and wrap this up. Philippians 4, verse 11, or excuse me, verse 6. Philippians 4, verse 6. And he says, be anxious, or be careful for nothing, but he's talking about, don't be anxious for anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, these are the things we need to dwell on. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. Well, what's true? Wasn't it Christ that always said, I tell you the truth? The only truth is the word of God. He says, whatsoever things are honest. Are you honest in your life? If you're not, then you need to make changes. And God will bless you for those changes. You may suffer at times because of your honesty, but you'll be blessed in the long run. He says, whatever, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. See, we hear the word truth and good. These are the things we need to think on. These are the things that we need to practice in our lives. If we focus on practicing these, we won't have as much time to worry about other things. And I told somebody one time, I said, stop worrying about tomorrow. Because all it does is bring misery today. You can't change tomorrow. All we can say is, Lord willing, we'll do this, or we'll do that, or this will happen. But it's by his will. And see, this is the way we need to think and change our minds. He says, whatsoever... And if there be any praise, think on these things, these things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. And so he says, the God of peace will be with you if you do these things. If we want to have peace in this life with all that's going on around us, not have to worry. You know, the, the, for example, the hurricane coming on shore. A few years ago, that probably would have kept me back in Missouri. But there was no fear. I said, you know, if anything, we'll go out and we'll rebuke the storm as, as Christ did. 
But we've got to learn more faith. We've got to have more faith. The sin times that we're going into, we need more and more faith. Where do we get the faith? Right here. And through prayer and asking God for the wisdom and understanding. Don't let torment and fear rule your life. Don't let Satan get a hold in your life. Don't let him get, even get a foot in the door of your life. But stay in the Word. Study the Word of God. Apply it to your life. If you don't understand it, go on and read something else. And then ask God when you go back to, to share that with you. And just keep reading it and reading it and going back. I've had many people say, why do we keep studying this? Because we don't know it well enough. We can never know enough about God's Word, so we can always learn. There's always room for learning. If we ever stop learning, then again, we've started down a path to destruction. So don't let ter torment or fear rule in your lives. Trust God in everything. Put your life, everything that you have, into God's hands, and He will bring you peace. <coughs>